podcast today, we're going to be jumping into some things that um, I hope anyway, as usual, are not only controversial because life is, but practical and answers questions in your life. So there's um, a lot of talk and we'll cover them eventually, but uh, just before going uh, on the air, uh, the staff, we're all uh, the, the wonderful people that are on the other side of that camera lens uh, behind you. Um, we were discussing the movie Nefarious. If you've not seen it, you must see it. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart, but don't let that sway you. It's not a um, an exorcist type movie. It's not going to glorify Satan. It's not that kind of stuff. It's absolutely powerful. You must see this movie. Uh, I highly endorse it. In fact, I have endorsed it. Uh, Steve uh, Deese, the author of the book, Nefarious, about uh, seven years ago, wrote the book. The movie is based on the book. The acting is world class. In fact, uh, what's the guy's name? Sean, F Sean Patrick Flannery. Uh, if Hollywood had any decency and sense and, and stability, he's hands down the best actor of the year. Hands down. Nobody comes close. Uh, but it won't, it won't make it to Hollywood because uh, it reveals Satan's tactics. But if you get a chance, but it, it really dovetails into without endorsement and encouragement to, for you to go see that film, Nefarious, um, is the fact that what are we looking at right now in this world around us? There's a undeniable, overwhelming, proof positive exhibition of what the Bible says is an age that is of the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist. Now, John told us in 1 John that even 2,000 years ago, uh, he said, you guys all know, don't you, that the Antichrist is coming. But he said, we also know that the spirit of Antichrist is in the world now, and that, because that's true, there are many who are Antichrist uh, in what they believe and what they say and what they do. So, number one, the Antichrist, Mr. 666, is coming. But in the meantime, and it has always been present, the spirit of Antichrist, which is technically the denial of biblical truth, the denial of the deity of Christ, the denial of the power of the resurrection— and um, the atoning death of Christ on the cross. The spirit of Antichrist is literally the spirit behind all cults, all pseudo-cults, and even those that are known as Christian cults. Uh, it is demonic uh, sway. And so uh, that's no shock. Bible makes it crystal clear. It has mentioned this for over 2,000 years. But what do we see today in our time? Uh we preach, we teach, we read books, we go to movies, we 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 uh, see things like the Left Behind series or the Passion of the Christ or uh, 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 the Coming Convergence or things like that, and we say, "Wow, yeah, biblical, amazing, yes." But do we really believe that? I think we are in a time now where uh, God is saying to us, "Do you really?" You've said you believe these things, but do you really? Because right now we're at a moment that is undeniably evil. And I'm talking to the Christian right now, you guys, that if you try to say today, for example, oh, let's not worry about what's happening with the Dodgers or with Target. That's just a spike. It's just a weird thing. It'll go away. Um, it's not going to go away. It's not going to go away. Even if the Dodgers... Uh, change their tune on exalting Satanism and promoting Satanism. Even if Target, which uh, I, I mentioned last night in a message with Eric Metaxas, um, even if the even if Target says, "All oh, right, all right, uh, we're going to take all of our LBGTQ, LMNOP, uh, XYZ." Uh, stuff, and we, we'll move it from the front of the store to the back of the store. Sorry, please give us. Please give us the $12 billion that you would have spent that we've lost. Can you give it back, please? Uh, some dum-dums are going to say, oh, isn't that great? They heard, they heard our, our anger and we, we, they move the, they move the, the male bikini tuck and roll st stuff, your stuff, underwear st stuff, 
uh, to the back of the store. We won, we won. No, Target laughs at your face, uh, especially Satan, because here's what happens. Satan takes two steps forward. You sh get in a big shock. And then he says, oh, all right. He takes one step back. <laughs> He's still there. He just moved the stuff to the back of the store. Target wins. They get their $12 billion back from suckers. And we move on and we feel better. Listen, don't fall for Satan's tactics. And I want to mention some of the tactics that are happening right now. How do we know that we're in the age of the Antichrist and the spirit of the Antichrist is active in the world today? I'm not even going to mention woke and apostate churches. Uh, they're on every street corner now. I'm talking about the infiltration of satanic thought and actions that are in our world in the general public square let's just talk about that forget about the church forget about the 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 you know uh, s satanism is it in the public square ask yourself that question are we dealing with satanic issues publicly now everybody in media shows commercials clothing music ask yourself are we looking at an age that has been infiltrated and the talking points are around the issue of aberrant sexuality? Law, cities, municipalities, court decisions. Ask yourself, is that a manifestation of the spirit of Antichrist? The answer is an overwhelming yes. If you deny that, then you better read 1 John near the back of your Bible, before the book of Revelation, before the book of Jude, you better read 1 John. Because if, if you say, nah, that's, that's, it's okay, it's okay. You yourself have fallen into the sway of the wicked one, Satan himself. So number one is infiltration, which leads to what? Influence. The culture, is it not being influenced on every possible angle? So now we've got sports teams I shouldn't even say the teams because that's not fair to the players. We've got lunatics, freaks. Are they Satanist? Are they LBGTQY, LMNOP, swayed, whatever their thing is, to have a Dodger homo night? What in the world's going on? What's happening? And it's not just the Dodgers. It's happened in some other teams. The influence, because of the infiltration, there's an influence. And it's happening. We cannot let that happen. I'm afraid, though, and in the age in which we live in, most Christians don't even want to hear this podcast because, Pastor Jack, that's this is too strong. It's it's too strong. Uh, I you know I don't need to hear this. You need to hear this, and you need to do something about it. God bless the people who are starving out now. Target, look, we all like Target. I mean, Target. As I'm not talking the management. Their products, great stuff, great prices. Chip and Joanna Gaines, um, I think they're still in that store. Never going to buy anything from Target, which means I'm never going to buy anything from Chip and Joanna again because that's in Target. That being the point, it's a great store that was screwed up by bad decision making. Why? Because the leadership of Target was influenced. Same with the Dodgers, which is going to really kill them if you think about it, because L.A. is heavily Hispanic. Hispanics are heavily Catholic, and the Dodgers have chosen to have these transvestite, trans men dress up as the sisters of perpetual indulgences, and the Dodgers have chosen to celebrate that. How does that happen? How does that happen at, uh, in the U.S. Air Force? U.S. Air Force is hosting drag queen events. United States Air Force. I'm paying for that. So are you in your taxes. Uh, <laughs> listen, I believe in God, and I, by, by God's mercy, our airplanes aren't falling out of the sky. But couldn't God just say, you know what? The Air Force offended me. I'm going to pull the wings off your airplanes while you're flying around. He could do that. But um, influence. The next thing, third thing is on this is, listen, infiltration leads to influence, which leads to indoctrination. Indoctrination. Ask yourself, is that happening right now? Indoctrination. If you don't think it is, then you need to wake up and you need to go to a school board meeting in your town. In fact, I'm asking you to go to a school board meeting in your town no matter what. You can just, you know, you can go. Show up and sit down. You don't have to say anything. You just listen. You'll be shocked at the glorification 
of porn and their hatred for the Bible and for Christians and for American history. Oh my gosh, their hatred for George Washington. They can't stand him. They can't stand Thomas Jefferson. They can't stand uh, anything that's American. They hate the fact in history. Don't even want to talk about it. When they get a page of, or maybe not even a page of World War II history and how America freed the world in two theaters of war at the same time from us being, the world would have been divided, by the way, into two nations if it wasn't for the United States. There would have been the Empire of Japan and there would have been the Third Reich of Adolf Hitler. And those two, those two kingdoms would have divided the world in half. Think about it. Japan would have taken the West and Germany would have taken the East. That would have been it. But America got involved and saved the world. Nobody wants to talk about that stuff because that's American stuff. You want to be careful about indoctrination. Our kids right now today know more about Madonna. They know more about um, what's her face? Uh, it doesn't matter. I can't even think of her name. If you ask, if you ask them pulp, pop uh, culture questions, they know the answer uh, to Justin Bieber's thing or to whatever. If you ask them, who's Alexander Hamilton? If you ask them, who, who was the first president? God forbid that you should ask your college graduate, who was the third president of the United States? And how many votes did he win by? They don't have a clue. It's pathetic. Why? Because they've been indoctrinated by an agenda that I'm telling you is satanic, and it's the spirit of Antichrist. All right? What happens after indoctrination? It's where we're at. It's where we're at today. In fact, here's, here's my reminder. You shouldn't see this, but I'm showing it to you. The spirit of satanic what? Infiltration, influence, indoctrination, underlined. The spirit of Antichrist produces a spirit of intoxication. Good, normal people you thought were able to maybe even watch your kids who have now been flushed out. Grandmas, grandpas, neighbors, sisters, brothers, friends, cousins, aunts, uncles. They have been intoxicated by a demonic influence to accept the... Uh, sexual aberrance of what's happening in our world. And you've got people that are 80 years old saying, well, uh, it doesn't really bother me or affect my life. So whatever, you know, live and let live. Uh, that is the spirit of Antichrist. And now we don't even know who we can trust with our kids. And it's obviously, it's a no brainer that the schools, we cannot trust with our children anymore, but who in our family do you know for sure uh, are not going to let your children view something as they're babysitting your kids or say something? What's happening? Intoxication. I know people, you know people who up until recently, they were staunch believers in the Bible and they would say the word of God is true, every word of it. And then they found out that their grandson is trending uh, homosexual or whatever. Uh, and the family pulls back. We want to display Christian love, so we're going to tolerate. Um, we're going to put up with it. You're actually sealing that poor child's fate by not intervening in their life and putting the kid back on track. You know, isn't it funny that your boss doesn't handle you like that at work, do they? The companies that you work for? If you make a bad decision, I made a bad decision. I was uh, 20. I was 22 years old. And I was given a project at the co corporation I worked for. And um, I read the blueprints wrong. And I made a mistake. And by the time my boss showed up, we were working overtime. It was a Saturday. We had a, this big, serious project thing that we had to get done. It was a medical research project, and we were going to do these trials uh, in various uh, teaching universities uh, for medical issues. And I made a mistake. I read the blueprint wrong, and it cost 
Back, listen, when I was 21, 22 years old, this is a lot of money. I made, I made a $17,500 mistake by reading the blueprint wrong. And I turned around and I told everybody, this is how this is thing's supposed to come together. I was wrong. I got called into HR. I was just scalded in hot water by my manager, the R&D research, a group that funded the project. I was just ripped a new one. And I, you know what happened? I wound up continuing to work there for 13 years. I wound up retiring from that group to do this this church uh, that God had us do. But the point was this, is that I never made that mistake again. Why? They didn't fire me. They should have, but they said, you know what? You, you can't do this ever again. And we're going to make, we're going to guide you in the right direction. Your grandson, your granddaughter, your child needs guidance. Don't fall for the duping and the doping of intoxication. The next thing that's going to happen more and more now. So that's, I believe we're in the state of intoxication right now where people are saying good is evil. Evil is good. Light is dark. Dark is light. Uh, uh, straight is gay. Gay is straight. It doesn't matter. Pick whatever you choose. Let's do whatever's right in our own eyes, which now leads to just the spirit of, of satanic impulse. If you think it, there's no filter, do it. I was watching on YouTube. I didn't mean to. You know this stuff pops up on your on YouTube. And I don't know why this popped up. Truly, I certainly my searching provoked it or you know, AI is always listening on your device. But there was this thing that popped up and it said uh, unbelievable. And it showed just two guys on the street. One guy was sitting down on the curb with his head in his hands, and the other guy was standing behind him. And I shouldn't have done it, but I clicked on it. And the guy taking the video was saying, what's that guy going to do? What's he going to do? Oh, man, those two guys are stoned. It was San Francisco, of course. Uh, oh, man, they're just stoned. Broad daylight, they're just stoned. And, by the way, for the record... The black guy sitting on the curb with his head in his hands was a black guy, and the black guy standing behind him with a gun pulled out of his sh shirt was a black guy. And the black guy with the gun put the gun at the back of the black guy's head, and the guy's recording it from inside the store saying, no way, no way, no way, and boom, killed the guy, shot him through the head right on the spot. What happened? Impulse. Satanic. A human destroying a human is satanic. Abortion is satanic. Murder, satanic. Abuse, satanic. Just say it. It's satanic. It's satanic. Well, those of you with your psychological degrees, which I have long time discovered, by the way, that people with psychological degrees, maybe you have your doctorate in psychology, uh, a lot, not all, a lot of people take psychology in college to try to figure themselves out. Think of that. A lot of people are confused about their own life. So they take psychology. They did, they get, they might get their master's or their doctorate in it because they're trying to figure out their own lives. Look, I don't want anybody talking to me about how to run my life when they're trying to figure out their own life. That's why me as a pastor tell you, don't listen to me and read your Bible. People have impulses and you're not supposed to act on them. If you, if you live in New York, uh, if you live in L.A., if you live in Seattle, God help the people of Seattle. They only have one freeway. You know that? I think it's the five, all those people. Thank God, at least in L.A., we've got like 50 freeways. If one's bad, we can jump on the other one. The thing is impulse. You know what our impulses are? I was Yesterday, I was at a museum here with my grandkids. And they had the Batmobile in there. It was an auto museum. And it had all this great stuff on it. You know the cool thing about the Batmobile? You press a button and blow up the stuff in front of you. Machine guns pop out of the grill. Like James Bond's car, but even better. And I thought, man, the Batmobile would be awesome to have on an L.A. freeway. Somebody cuts me off. <laughs> boom. Bang. Right? Jack, you can't admit that. You can't, you can't believe that. Listen, I fight impulses just like you do. I'm just being honest enough to tell you impulses most often are wrong.
and dangerous and deadly. And then finally, f- impulses lead to indictments. Indictments? Yep. God says this is wrong, and I'm going to come back and deal with it. Or God says this is wrong, and in the day you die, you're going to have to face the music. Indictments. Right now, God is indicting the Dodgers, Coles, Target, Bud Light. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's absolutely hilarious. Uh, people, and it, listen, what do we do about it? Well, number one, listen, if you're not a Christian, you are a sitting duck to be influenced by satanic powers. The Christian is uh, controlled and uh, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and yet the Christian is, is fighting demonic attack. We get to fight it. But if you're not a Christian, you're a sucker to it, to uh, its influence. You need to know right now, once and for all, if the Holy Spirit is inside of you. Because if he's not, you're open to an unholy spirit. And the Bible's very clear in the book of 1 Corinthians that if the Spirit of God dwells in you, God will not share the temple of your body with the demonic spirit. Christians cannot be demon-possessed. They can be oppressed. They can be depressed. They can be suppressed by demonic spirits. But a Christian can never be possessed by a spirit. You, on the other hand, who are not a Christian, what are you going to do? What do you do? What are you going to do when they're coming out shortly with the art of the AI version is coming? It's a game of the Ouija board. What are you going to do about that when some pretty trippy things happen on this on this new AI game board? What are you going to do about it? You, you'll have no power. You'll fall to all of these things that I just mentioned to you. Give your life to Jesus Christ now. We're not playing games. The hour is late. Listen, big end time things will be happening shortly. I think they've already started. We're not in the tribulation period. We've made that very clear in previous, previous broadcast. But Jesus could come back today, and it would be really, really crummy if you're left behind. Because if you're left behind, 2 Thessalonians 2 says you have no hope. Watch this. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead for your justification. He's the Son of God, Savior of the world. It's a historical fact what he did for us in Jerusalem. Prophesied in the Bible in advance. You reject that right now. Rapture happens this afternoon. You're left behind. You're done. You are done. Read 2 Thessalonians 2. It's over for you. You will. Your judgment will be for rejecting the news while you had it. The Bible there tells you that you will be sold a bill of goods. A word will be given to you by the Antichrist or by a demon spirit, and you're going to believe it. Why? Because God will seal you like you standing in wet concrete. Eventually, it hardens. Don't be that person. Heavy stuff, I know, but true all the way. Listen, we'd love for you to hit subscribe and share this podcast with others around you. And remember, what we believe in is this. It's time to live out what you believe in. Let's all do that. It's time for real life. This Jack Hibbs podcast, as well as all the broadcast outreach, Hey everybody, first of all, welcome to the podcast that we are bringing to you today. And it's obviously a special time, a special season. And I'm going to do something a little bit, well, special. And that is, I am going to uh, springboard off of um, a message I gave uh, recently regarding Christmas. And it's a uh, it's a Christmas series, uh, but it's really regarding a verse, I have to confess to you, um, the way that I prepare a message is that I pray first with a blank notepad uh, with Bible open, and I write down thoughts that come into my head. And I don't go to I don't go to I never go to other people's sermons, even though they're great. Um, I just don't. The Lord and I have a thing together where I believe He's alive and real. I believe His Bible is alive and real, and I believe that He is for. Uh, us in the here and now. In other words, I believe that God is not only relevant, I believe that he's what the old word would be prescient, which means he is ready to meet tomorrow for us 
today, okay? So I only look at commentaries after I have a sermon prepared to make sure that my theology is sound and safe. So it's alone with God, notepad, Bible open, and I've been preparing, going through a series uh, during this Christmas season of 2023, uh, and and it's, I just got the title of it, His Return. You say, well, Jack, wait a minute, His Return? You mean you mean when He comes back in the rapture or when He comes back in the second coming to earth? Uh, yeah, sure, but no. That's not exactly what I was thinking, His Return. You say, Jack, what, you know, what's on your head? So as I began to just think about the Christmas message, the Christmas Advent to mankind, the gospel of God given to people. It dawned on me the first message that God would send the Messiah into the world, it's not a New Testament doctrine. A lot of people think that the Christmas message is a Christian Christmas New Testament message. And in all reality, it's not. And you may be thinking right now, I'm going to turn you off, Jack. You're wrong. Nope, I'm right. And I'll prove it to you. And I can do it in one verse. In one verse. And it's this. Write it down if you would. It's Genesis 3.15. Now, before I read it, I want to have you make sure that you make a um, a note of this or that you forward this podcast to any of your Jewish friends. For that matter, if you know any Muslims, uh, send it to them as well. Uh, especially Jewish people, but Muslims as well. First of all, let's get Islam and the Muslim um, off the table. And, and let's just answer this. Muslims claim to honor Moses. Well, if they really did, then they would have to approach the first five books of Moses like any one of us, like all of us, Gentile and Jew alike. The Muslim would have to do the same thing because the Muslim would have to honor Moses and thereby read Genesis. But if you read Genesis as a Muslim, you come to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and that becomes a problem if you're a Muslim. If you're a Jew, because right now you're a Jew, you're saying, stick it to him, Jack. <laughs> well, if you're a Jew, it's you're going to get a bone stuck in your throat. Or you're going to find out that you have a pebble in your shoe, so to speak, right? Genesis 3.15 to the Jew is what we would say uh, in English, is a conundrum. It is a revelation of truth that demands that you accept it one way and one way only. I love this. God who speaks in truth doesn't speak with options. I mean, listen, he gives you the option to choose him or not. That's about it. He's the God of all truth. He's not the God of multiple choices which is awesome. That's why, by the way, allow me, my Jewish friends, hang on. Let me sneak ahead for a second. I know you don't believe this, but Yeshua, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Okay, John 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to heaven but through me. This is what Jesus said. This is what Yeshua as Messiah said. I, I know my Jewish friends don't believe that. That's okay for now. But if you go to Genesis 3.15 as a Jew, because look, I'm a Gentile. And I had a lot of fun the other day. Can't remember who I was talking to. Um, oh, I, I am actually not going to say his name, nor his political office he's a because that would not be cool he's he's jewish and he's a political he's in israeli politics 
And I had a chance to say to him, you might think that I'm a follower of Jesus as Messiah because of the New Testament. I am not. The New Testament only substantiates and answers what the Old Testament declares. And I said to him, your Old Testament, your Hebrew prophets. He was puzzled. And I showed him some verses. But one of the reasons is this. Genesis 3.15, you guys, this is what it says. I guess I should back up, right? Because Genesis 3.15, Genesis 3 is where Adam and Eve sin. They have fallen. And the Lord is walking through the garden and calls out, Adam, where are you? Which is an amazing invitation. Adam, I believe this because of what is called expositional constancy. So what does that mean? That means from Genesis to Revelation or for the Jew, from Genesis to Malachi, the exposition of God's word stays the same. It never changes. If God says this, for example, when God says, I love Israel, my covenant with Israel is forever, then everything else has to be read through the lens of the unchangeableness of God, the immutability of God, which means God loves Israel and he will never, never, ever, never change the covenant that he's made with Israel. In fact, you can read that in great detail in Jeremiah 31, um, among other passages of scripture, God says that these things are so true, my covenant with Israel, that as long as the heavens exist and the sun and the moon uh, course through their sky from day, day to day, so long as my covenant with Israel forever. So do keep that in mind. Expositional constancy is what the word says, is what the word will always say. I love that. I'm not sure about anything in this world. I'm not sure about uh, my my name, technically, I mean, I look, I do, uh, what is that thing? You know, your DNA, 23 and me, and all this kind of stuff, and my name is supposed to mean this, and these are the lineage of my blood. Who knows? <sighs> One thing I know for sure is God's word will never change, because God cannot change, and he says, my word cannot change. Okay, that's a big preamble to get into what we're looking at right now, and it is this. And so... I'm going to start in Genesis 3, 9. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Which is an act of mercy. Adam, I'm inviting you to step forward and confess. He didn't do it. He stayed hidden. He thought, wrapped up in leaves. And so he said, I heard your voice in the garden. Can you imagine this to the human eye, this bush, you can hear a voice coming out of some shrubs. I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. Isn't that amazing? So the nakedness of Adam, meaning he sinned, immediately he was aware and conscious of. That means his, that his, his, his psyche, his consciousness was immediately guilty. That's one of the things about mankind today is mankind is born into guilt. We are guilty. And your little grandson and your little granddaughter or your little son, your little daughter is guilty and they know it. They don't know how to cope with that, but they're guilty. They're guilty. They're guilty of lying to you. They're guilty of stealing cookies. They're guilty of, of uh, whatever they do. They're guilty. We're all guilty. We're naked. We're just like Adam. We're naked. Lord, I'm naked. Guilt. And so he says, I hid myself. Verse 11, and he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Of course, God knew this. Again, what is he doing? This is the second time God is, is uh, requisition, uh, luring, as it were, wooing. Adam, confess. Just confess. Wow. You can't do that, though. Pride won't let you do that. Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to me with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And then the woman said, the serpent deceived me. So Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent, which ultimately is, this is the psychology that's going on. 
God, you gave me a defective woman. That's what, it's all your fault. Hey, you gave me a defective snake. This thing you made, you shouldn't have done this, God, right? God's, they're, they're blaming God. That's what they're doing. And we still do that today when our hearts are not in the right place. And so the woman said that the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed among all cattle and more than every beast of the field. And on your belly, you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Uh, that's Genesis 3.14. I just want to say this. Um, I know that um, there's a guy at um, Hillsdale College it's not a good start, by the way. He is a literature teacher. He's got his doctorate in literature, but he's teaching a theology course. Well, not I'm not even going to say it that way. Uh, he's teaching a course on Genesis from a literary background, which he approaches it as poetic and nuance. Um, he talks about the underlying um, symbolisms and what is tucked away in the narrative and what is, uh, you know, a storyline. Listen, note to self, you never want to have a doctorate of literature be teaching theology in a college course, and the conclusion is Genesis is not a book to be taken literally. It's pathetic. And in that course, he says, you can't take it literally because a serpent, everybody knows a serpent crawls on its belly. You can hear the, you can even hear the class laugh in the chorus. So what's God saying here? Excuse me? That's not what the Bible says. The serpent did not crawl on its belly in Genesis 3 until it was cursed by God. Then it crawled on its belly. Somehow the serpent stood upright. On what? Legs? I don't know. Did it stand up on the end of its tail and move? I don't know. I wasn't there. And neither was the professor at Hillsdale College on this one. Nobody was there except God and Adam and Eve and Satan and the animal kingdom. In this case, the serpent. Very important to remember this. The serpent was cursed. Thus, then it was forced to crawl on its belly after the fall. That's theology. That's what the Bible says. So its judgment was on its belly, it shall go. Here comes the punch. Here comes the Christmas line, the Christmas theology. God says, I will put warfare, enmity, between you, he's speaking to Satan, and the woman, that's Eve, and between your offspring, the seed, Satan's offspring, I'm going to put a warfare between your offspring and her offspring. Now, the word in your Bible says seed. Uh, it's where we get the modern day term for us out of the Greek. And even the Latin is sperm or sperma. This is the seed of man, the seed of male, male DNA, male. See, we have a problem here. And yeah, we do have a problem here if we've got a very, very dinky God, but thank God we don't. I'm going to put warfare between you, Satan, and your offspring, and between her and her offspring. You guys are going to war against each other. Oh, but you can cheer up, everybody. Satan's seed, his descendants, those that come from him, what is Satan known for? Pride, unbelief, and he's at war with God. Oh, and by the way, the fine print is he's at war with women. He's at war with women because from woman is this promise, Genesis 3.15, that something's going to come. Someone is going to come from woman. So listen up, ladies. Satan hates your guts. <laughs> Have a nice day, all, all you ladies and women out there. Satan hates your guts. Uh, that actually should be a great encouragement. Satan hates women. That's why he prostitutes women. That's why he traffics with women. That's why he uh, ha abuses women. Satan hates women. Why? Because God has a special place in his heart for women. And one of them is that from woman would come the Messiah of the world. You say, where do you get that from? Genesis 3.15. Look in your Bibles. It's capital S signifying from the Old Testament, from Moses himself, that 
the woman and from the women's from from Eve's line that eventually from a woman would come uh divinity that something would happen regarding the woman not having sperm but an egg that something would happen in in a woman that from her seed this is a miracle you guys from her seed watch what would happen that from your seed he shall watch this he shall bruise your head the word in hebrew is crush he whoever the seed is is a male so you've got a female and her seed being male her offspring is of divine origin it doesn't involve intercourse or a human male there's a divine impregnation of a female to come in the days of Moses to come. He will be divine. Whoever he is, my Jewish friends, whoever he is, Genesis 3.15, Moses said, whoever he is, he's going to crush Satan's head. But Satan will crush his heel. Stop right there. Moses said, a divine one will come from human origins of a woman, not a man, a woman, male, not a male, female, not a male, but from a female. In fact, excluding a male, but from a human female. The origin will be divine, the seed, capital S. Whoever he is, he will destroy Satan. Can Moses destroy Satan? No. Any of the prophets? Nope. Can Michael, the archangel that presides over the protection of Israel? Nope. How about Gabriel that appeared to Daniel? Daniel chapter 9. Nope. Who in the Old Testament scriptures can destroy Satan? There's only one. And that's God himself. The question should be in your mind. If God is, if, if, sorry, if Moses is true, now you see what's happening here. If, if Moses is true, all of a sudden I'm casting a provocative threat deliberately, sarcastically, lovingly to not only all believers, but especially to my Jewish friends. If Moses is a man of God, if Moses was called by God, if God spoke through Moses, and if God is the author of the scriptures, we have a major problem in front of us or a ginormous blessing. Whoever the one who is to come is coming is going to destroy Satan's work but Satan is going to have the opportunity to crush his heel. I'll submit, I'll submit this to you, and then we have to wrap it up. I'm supposed to stick to 20 minutes. Don't know why. I, it could be the 11th commandment, just joking, but here's the deal. Whoever Moses is talking about, it's not Moses. And it's not Israel. But when he comes, he's going to come through a woman. And when he comes through a woman, him coming is required for him to destroy the works of Satan. Satan is going to inflict pain against him, but only in the heel. If you read Isaiah 53 about Israel's Messiah, that makes sense. If you read Psalm 22, the Psalm of David, that makes sense. If you read Psalm 2, that makes sense. If you read Zechariah chapter 12, 13, and 14, makes sense. What's going on here? The Christmas message is found in Genesis 3.15. His return 
was prophesied in Genesis 3.15. That after the fall, God in the garden speaks to the serpent and says, boy, are you going to get yours in the end? And oh, by the way, Adam and Eve, I'm going to redeem you. It's going to be in the future. From your descendants, Eve. Now, I know many of my Jewish friends will not even look or listen. You have been told by your rabbis, you cannot read the New Testament. It is forbidden. Isn't it interesting, by the way, they also say that there are Old Testament chapters and books that are forbidden to you as well. A little bit of a test. Oh, my friends, please, I hope you, I hope you haven't tuned, 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 us, tuned, me, tuned us off yet. Isn't it interesting that all of the forbidden scriptures that your rabbis tell you not to read, every single one of them deal with the Messiah coming to rescue you and save you? I want you to think about that for a minute. So you see, my friend, I believe that Yeshua is Messiah because I believe Moses. I believe Genesis 3.15 is from God. I believe that at this Christmas time, which is just, you know what, I don't even care about the date. The date is irrelevant. It's not when Jesus was born, December 25th. We all know that. That was pagan. That was set up by Constantine, Roman Empire. <laughs> It's a day for people to sell stuff and all that stuff. I get all that. Get together, eat turkey, whatever. For the real follower of Messiah, it's just another day for us. We celebrate his coming every day. Listen, we take Sabbath, like my Sabbath is a Monday, to rest physically. But my Sabbath of my soul is every day. I don't have one day a week set aside for my soul to Sabbath. I have found my rest. I have found my peace. My shalom is in him. Listen, we can talk about this some other time. I plan on doing more and more messages to reach our Jewish friends, especially at a time like this. And I know that you have no commitment at all to listen to some bonehead Gentile tell you about your scripture. I don't want you to believe me. I want you to take these scriptures, Genesis 3.15, and take it to your rabbi. Ask him. Look into it for yourself. Here's your questions, and then we'll end. Who was Moses talking about? Who crushes Satan's head? Who gets inflicted by Satan in the heel? Who inflicts? Who is it that Satan's going to inflict pain upon? But that same one is going to crush Satan's head. Look, you can walk away from a crushed heel. <laughs> you can't walk away from a crushed head. And so I want, to, I want to not only say Happy Hanukkah, Holy Hanukkah, I like that better, but Holy and Merry and Happy Christmas to those who know what it means. Listen, as always, it's our intentions here at our real life podcast to have you live out what it is that you believe in, which means if you do that, it's time for you to live real life, right? So if these podcasts matter to you, again, I plead with you, we don't need your money. We're not asking for it. Well, look, we're not going to reject it. If you send money to us, we're going to reinvest in these podcasts and in real life media, which has a plethora of other platforms where we get the word out, but we're not asking for your money. Notice how many commercials you just had, right? This is a total faith thing. God's going to speak. God's going to provide. If he doesn't want us to do this, he's going to shut us down. I'm totally good with that. I'll go to the beach instead. My point is, I want you to look at truth. God's word is true. If you don't believe that, test them. Go to Genesis 3.15 and disprove it. But we want to hear from you. Go to jackhibbs.com. We're not going to bug you. And leave us a message. Leave us a note. Yes, by the way, you have. Drop dead. We've been hearing things like that. But you know what? For every drop dead, we've been hearing hundreds of, wow, I didn't know that before. Okay? So please. 
Until next time, God bless you guys. Share this. You can help us by promoting on the algorithm. If you just give us a like button, promote this, share it, and spread it around because then it bumps it up on the algorithm uh, among the tech uh, world and it increases our viewership, okay? And what does that mean? That means you play a part in helping us get the word out. So let's do it together, okay? Well, friends, have you ever considered the truth and the reality that God knows you by name? Some of you might find that to be rather shocking because after all, isn't God super busy? Doesn't God have a lot going on? And how in the world would he ever remember or let alone know you? And yet let's remember this about the very nature of God. This book, the Bible, is his book to us. This is the will of God and it's God's will that you know him. God is knowable. I'm not talking about the gods of some mystics or the gods of some uh, ancient people group. I'm talking about the eternal God. There's only one God, his word tells us. And this one God is the God who knows you. And the fact of the matter is, is that he knows everything about you. The, the, his, this Bible, his Bible says that he knows the things about you before they ever happen. He knows your thoughts before they arrive in your head and he knows the days of your life. So listen, my friend, to those of you who have chosen Christ, have accepted Christ, then the Spirit of God lives in you. And he bears witness to the fact that you are a child of God. He lives in you, and the Bible makes it very clear that he's given you the power to overcome anything that comes into your life. So listen, my friends, there's no need to fear, doubt, or to worry because the God of heaven knows you. Let's grab our Bibles, let's dive in to see what God's word has to say to you and I about how he knows us by name and how intimate we can actually know him. So church, let's dive into our Bible study now. When we talk about saying it, don't talk about religion. We don't wanna talk about church. I don't know if you're visiting here for the first time or not, but the last thing the people around you want to do, I agree with them, and that is we could do a whole lot of other things on a morning like this than to come and just be religious. Who needs that? What we want to do is experience the true, awesome power of the living God. Listen, if Christ is not risen from the dead, then there is no salvation. We have no hope, so let's leave. What's the old saying? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. There is no eternity. Whoever dies with the most toys wins. And that's the thinking of the world. But Christ is risen from the dead, and that changes everything. And so we don't want to talk about it. We want to say it. We want to say it to the world. And we say this. This is what we looked at last time, is that the Lord has called you his own. Oh, this gets beautiful. The Bible there said to us in our previous study, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. Notice God did not save you to put you in a place of fear. In fact, if you understand your great salvation that is upon your life, fear dissipates. I'm not being cavalier when I tell you this. Fear has no place in the life of a believer. That doesn't mean we're ignorant. It doesn't mean that we're not aware of the science. It doesn't mean that we're not aware of the weather. It doesn't mean that we're not aware of the economy. We're aware of all those things, I believe. Probably more in tune than most people. But we're not held by fear. The world has never been a scarier place to live in, in my opinion. But the Christian has no fear. The Bible tells us that we are to fear one, and that is God and him only. Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who can kill you, but rather be in fear of him who can both take your life and send your soul to hell. Wow. 
That verse goes on, verse 15, but you receive the spirit. Notice the contradiction. There's the bondage of the spirit of fear, but there's the liberty of the spirit of adoption. He says, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Remarkable, beautiful thing. And we looked at this, church, Abba, Father. It's the Aramaic word. Mark this verse down if you would. It's Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you he made alive. He's speaking to the Christian. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, a reference to Satan. It's pretty creepy, right? He's the prince of the power of the air, atmosphere. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Thank God, though. Listen to Galatians 4, verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. Listen, ask yourself, is that true of your life? Well, Pastor Jack, how can I know? Because you will be preempted or prone to cry out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. That's good news. That's awesome news. One more time. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 15. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. This is a profound statement, church. The Holy Spirit is speaking nonstop, 24-7, 365. The word implies continually to you, the believer. The Holy Spirit is bearing witness. He's speaking to you and to us. For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. That is a powerful statement. I know there's a lot of talk these days about you can think whatever you want to think as long as you don't go do it. The Bible says no way. The Bible says what you think about, you wind up doing. And it matters what you think. It matters what you uh, meditate on. It matters what you fantasize about. God sees and God knows. But the born again heart, the new heart, is a heart that is changed because the spirit of God and the spirit of adoption dwells within us. What a glorious thing. We are owned by the living God. My name's Jack. It means nothing. But God's got a new name according to the Bible for my life. Whatever your name is, the Bible says, when you and I show up in heaven, we're going to get a new name. Now, some of you may have some. I met last, listen, I met recently uh, who was visiting from Canada, Anastasia. What a name. Now, I don't know what that name means in Canadian, (laughs) but in Russian, it means resurrection. That's awesome. What's Jack mean? (laughs) I don't know. But I know this. God knows my name. He knows my real name. He knows your real name. And uh, that's one of the great thrills about getting into heaven. So listen, by name, God knows you. And it says in verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. The Holy Spirit is in union with our human spirit if we're born again, if the spirit of God lives within us. And I wrote myself this note to keep myself under control. And it's this, I say this humbly, thankfully, gratefully, yet with all confidence that this bears witness is for your peace, security, and confidence is the greatest, most assuring thing that I've experienced in my life. I mean that sincerely. Mark it down. Bears witness. Two words in English, one word in the Greek language. And it means this. It means to legally and officially give testimony which is admissible or eligible to be entered into the records of the court. Technically, the word court should be capitalized. It implies God's court. The Holy Spirit... For you, the believer, he knows you by name, and he is bearing witness before the courtroom of God that you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That should set you free. That should cause you to sit up straight and get excited about the world in which you and I have been deployed into. This is not heaven. Now look, Lisa and I just got back from a trip away with our kids and we went up to uh, Washington State, which yes, it's true, it's just as liberal as it is here. But when you get outside of the city, it's really, frankly, when you get outside of the city, it's just as conservative as it is here. Listen, you get out of LA and you get out of San Diego and you get out of Oakland and San Francisco and Sacramento and you find out there's people who actually think. <laughs> and, uh, and we experienced the same thing. And uh, we went to a place called Gig Harbor. Have you ever heard of Gig Harbor? Strange name, beautiful place. Now don't go there now that I've said it. We want to make sure it stays quiet and quaint. So the next time we go, it's, it's just as quiet and quaint. But the amazing thing about it is, you know you've gone to a good place when you don't want to leave. But might I remind you that this is not heaven? We're in a battlefield, friends. We're in a battleground. This whole world is. And you and I are children of the Most High God. Listen, our citizenship, the Bible says, is in heaven. But yet, we're still here in this world. And that's why we're battling light and darkness and evil and good. We must. The Holy Spirit within us compels us to confront things. We'll talk more about this in a moment. But understand this. It's very personal to me. And I, I'm fighting the temptation to make this really dramatic. I'm trying to be calm here. But for you and I and for many of us, in this nation, in this community. This portion of scripture should delight us that the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. It means God's got a testimony that is in real time regarding the things that you and I are living through. I know that there's a bumper sticker that says when the going gets tough, the tough go shopping. No, listen, when the going gets tough, the Christian goes to the word of God. And listen, when churches shut down, which might have been the best thing for some of those churches, I should say for the people that attended them, people ran. And they ran to the truth, no matter where they were in the world. They ran to the truth. Why? Because the Spirit of God has got your name. You ran to the truth. God was dealing out food, and you got in line, and you ate up the Word of God. Why? Because He's got your name. And you've been made anew, and the Holy Spirit lives in you. God knows your name. And I love that. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Acts 1, verse 3. He also presented himself, that is Jesus, alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. Don't you love that? Truth, the power of God. This God who came and died and rose again from the grave is exactly the God that you need. And thank God for those of us, he has our name. It's the God that we have. Our God came, he suffered and died and he rose again from the dead. Sign me up. Right? Think about it. The alternative, I hope, is unacceptable to you. And that is be religious. Join a group, join a church, join a cult. Go do your thing. Listen, I'm staying right here in the Bible. Right here in the word of God. He did it. He's going to see to it. He's going to get it done. It's him who came and died and rose again from the grave. All the things that concern you in this world, Jesus did. You break the grave. You conquer death. That's the God you want. And that's the God that we have if he's our Lord and Savior. But notice this out of Acts chapter 1 verse 3. Convincing proofs. That means confirming evidences, multiple things, which of course come from God, which are immutable facts. They don't change. Psalm 100, verse three. Psalm 100, verse three says, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank God we didn't make ourselves. First of all, we can't, but a lot of people in a way think that they have. Maybe they're evolutionists. This is, a, by the way, this is a really amazing time. You and I are living through this time right now. It's thrilling. Because you're either a Christian or you're not. Have you noticed gray area is gone? I love it. There, there's no way now for you can hide in the shadows. There's no shadows anymore. You're either a follower of God or you're not. And for those who are not, they're having a rough time explaining things that are going on around the world. 
And then we as believers are going, mm hmm, wow. Wait, what's the headline? Breaking news. Oh, wait. Oh, wow. Wait, this is going on in Israel. Hang on, wait, hang on. Oh, yeah, wow. Oh, World Economic Forum, Cashless Society, put a mark in your right hand. Wait, what? Oh, wow, thank you. It's all here. It's all here. What an amazing God. Isaiah 49, verse 1 says, The Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. Excuse me, hello, wait a minute. This is a 3,000-year-old statement. I don't even know if they knew back then that a female, the uterus, the female, the woman, has a matrix, this matrix. Isaiah, the prophet, under the inspiration of God, speaks biology. His statement is 100% admissible in the court of medical practice. Did you know that? The Bible says, I've called you from your womb. I brought you forth from the matrix of your mother. He has made mention of my name. Now this is a reference to the Messiah, but it's true about us as well. Is there convincing proofs, confirming evidences and immutable facts regarding our relationship with God? Oh yes, absolutely. The Holy Spirit is one with our spirit until Christ calls us home. And that word spirit, by the way, in both places here is the word that uh, we get pneumatic. You know what a pneumatic tool is, anybody? You go to a shop and they plug their tool in and you hear them go, sound, right? You know what that is? That's air-driven tools. Pneumatic. This is the word in the Greek. The believer, in association with the Holy Spirit, we are (laughs) air-driven. We are driven by the power of the Holy Spirit to be moved, empowered by the air. Air Air-driven, wind-driven, the breath that resides within the human soul, the observable and active consciousness of life. There's nobody in this room right now or watching right now that can deny the fact that you've got a consciousness. Listen, if you deny that you have a consciousness, you need to get, you need to hang up now, turn off the TV and dial 911. (laughs) You have a consciousness. And the Bible says that comes from God. The Holy Spirit air drives your life as it were. Now I like that because if you've ever seen an air driven tool, it's literally worthless until It's plugged into the air source. Look, this world says we're worthless. Sometimes we say of ourselves, I'm worthless. Well, I want to encourage you, get plugged in. The Spirit of God would love to plug you into his power, his source. And it's not reserved for me only. It's for, it's for anyone who will take that truth and say, that's it. I'm going to, I, my name is known to God. His spirit dwells within me and I'm going to live my life for him. And I'm going to quit calling the shots and I'm going to let him live his life through me. I'm going to, I'm going to be air driven from this moment forward. I tell you what, God will expel fear from your life. He'll give you purpose and vision. And once as Jesus said, you put your hand to the plow He says, don't look back. Now, we don't do plows anymore, but what happens is when you put your hands on a plow and you're moving forward, if you look back, you automatically turn. Okay, I don't know if you've ever driven a fast car, but there's, you never look over your shoulder when you're driving a very fast car. Did you know that? Never do that. You'll you'll wake up dead. (laughs) Just the turning of your neck turns the wheel. Don't do it. Jesus says, don't look back. Keep moving forward. Beautiful. Well, isn't it absolutely comforting to know this, that God knows you by name? And when we talk about the Holy Spirit in the believer, that is the Holy Spirit for everything that you and I need, when we talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, I love the fact that that pneuma, the pneumatic power of God, the wind of God, the surge of God's Holy Spirit's power in the life of the believer. Listen, it's my opinion, but I think it's pretty well documented by now that the church is very anemic in the world around us today. 
It doesn't take an Einstein to look around to see how evil is advancing. But where's the church standing up, right? Where's the countermeasures to what's going on in all of the evil of our world? Well, friends, listen, if you are a Christian today, I'm just speaking to the Christian. If you're a Christian today, I want to ask you, do you sense the power of God? Micah, the Old Testament prophet said, and I quote, I'm full of power by the Holy Spirit. I do believe that the New Testament teaches us, especially the book of Acts, that you and I should know the power of God in our lives. Listen, we're frail humans. Of course, God knows this, but he empowers us by his Holy Spirit. That's how you and I are able to do impossible things. In fact, I want to leave this picture in your mind, if you would. I, I had the opportunity of growing up in a home where my, my dad was uh, very much into mechanics. And I remember visiting shops and stuff as a little kid. I remember going to some auto races even where they had these air-driven tools, pneumatic tools, right? So by itself, this gun or this uh, air gun or this pneumatic tool for the, the nuts that would be on for the wheel of the race car, that it just sat there dead and lifeless. But there was this red rubber hose and the pit guy would take that hose and plug it in to the base of that, that pneumatic gun and it would come alive. And that seemingly dead gun could take the big wheels off of a race car. And it was quite amazing. The sound of it was impressive and the power of it was impressive. Friend, listen, you and I are lifeless without Jesus Christ, but it's his will that the Holy Spirit plug you in to the very power of God. He wants to use you like that, like that amazing tool. And so, friends, I want you to be leaning more upon the Holy Spirit. Say, Jack, it's so dark out there. You know, the world is so wicked. Don't let that get you down. Don't you know that's a wake up call to us to stand up and to get empowered by the Holy Spirit? Because listen, everything that you can do through Christ matters. But listen, for some of you, you need to start right here. You need to start by accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm gonna lead you in this prayer of salvation. Maybe these things are making sense, but now you've decided I want that power in my life because I need my sins forgiven, Christ died on the cross for me, and I wanna have a new life. I wanna come alive. So you would just simply pray, pray this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for me, and I give my life to you. I thank you for dying for me in Jesus' name, amen. If you've prayed that prayer, God has heard your prayer. We'd love to hear from you, not to get anything from you, but to send you material on how you can walk with Jesus Christ. Welcome to today's installment of our uh, Jacob's podcast. And first of all, we're very excited and delighted that um, the magnitude and multitude of you who have been hitting subscribe and signing up and listening, uh, we get to see, and I was just recently briefed on the the data behind the scenes on that, the, the listenership has been amazing. So we are encouraged. That's the greatest thing that you can do for us is to not only listen, but to subscribe and to share. And uh, you can do that by, of course, just simply going to jackhibbs.com and telling other people about the content, because that's how these things matter. So we put out on Facebook, I think it was, the other day, we asked you to provide topics that you are concerned about or topics that most um, uh, have co come up in your conversations or ones that you're concerned about. And so overwhelmingly, justifiably so, have been the questions regarding last day's events. Questions from the millennium, we're gonna talk about it. Great questions, by the way, about the millennium. Uh, questions about the rapture, what is it? Uh, questions about who's the antichrist? Questions about, does the Bible really predict the future? Uh, what do I do if it does? Uh, the world around me, what's going on? So we're not going to cover it all, obviously, in one uh, session together right now. Which, by the way, for those of you who are viewing this, do you see this really awesome little sticker? It says Real Life. I just thought, you know how the real professional guys that do podcasts have these really cool things? And it says, like, Turning Point USA or, or something like that. So... Um, so that's what we're doing right here. For those of you who are just watch, or listening right now, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But 
Uh, this is real life. And so we're pretty excited about that. So here's the deal. Let's dive into this. Uh, let's, let's take the next several podcasts. Let's, let's do this. Let's start from uh, defining the rapture. We'll define the rapture. And then in our following podcast, we will walk through the biblical chronology of end time events. How about that? You see, why do it that way? Because if we define the rapture, it covers several views we'll look at. And it's appropriate that when we lay down that foundation of biblical definition to the rapture, then we're going to be able to uh, place it in the right place or, or argue uh, why it's in this particular place. You're going to disagree. Some of you are going to disagree. That's totally cool. But know why we disagree. Uh, we're going to have some fun, though, together, because i got to tell you the reason why. I was saved at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa under Chuck Smith, and he taught pre-tribulation rapture. I believed it as a new believer because he believed it, and he taught it. And then I started studying other things, and I drifted away from a pre-tribulation rapture view, and I stopped being a pre-tribulational uh, rapture person. Uh, and I was, I held that position for probably three to five years, I would think. And, um, yet, uh, studying it, studying it, studying it more and more and more. I not only came back to a pre-tribulation rapture view, but I came back to a pre-tribulation rapture view with some word of a, with, with some way of a sanctified vengeance, uh, or passion, I should say, because, um, I understand both sides. I get both sides. And uh, one is, I have to tell you, one takes a lot of faith and one takes a lot of discipline and one takes um, a big burden off your shoulders and one really sets a fire under you to be ready every day and to be obedient every day. The other one causes you to be waiting for other things to happen, waiting for looking for other things to take place. And it's quite interesting to realize that uh, if there is a concept or a construct regarding the Lord's rapture, um, it matters how and what you believe about it uh, because it's translated in what you get involved in regarding your day-to-day -day life. So we're going to iron all this stuff out and um, we'll have some fun. So the first thing I want you to do, if you're taking notes and all, and forgive me, you, you know I don't usually have my computer here, but I want to make sure that uh, I step through some verses and some arguments that are going to be uh, quite fun. So number one, write this down, please. One of the great questions that was asked was, how can you believe in the rapture when the word rapture is not even in the Bible? And I understand the question, but for those of you who speak Latin, <laughs> Or read Latin. My grandson's learning Latin right now. So he knows, he knows the meaning of this word. In the Latin Bible, the word rapture appears. Uh, rapturo or, or raptus or what, what we would just simply say rapture. That's the conversation that we use in, in our English. Um, in the Latin Bible, it is the word rapture. Okay, so if you have a Latin Bible... It's there. And so the question comes from our Western American uh, English uh, position. I don't see the word rapture in the Bible, so I can't believe in it. Well, the word Bible is not in the Bible, but you believe in the Bible, right? I mean, there's a lot of things like that. So if you have a Latin Bible, the word rapture is there. If you have a Greek Bible, uh, the word harpazo is there for rapture, okay? If you have an English Bible in a newer translation, it may not, uh, uh, or most often says caught up, two words. Two English words to describe one word rapture, caught up. The word rapture means to actually be uh, quite suddenly and violently removed. It means to be taken out of or taken away from. Imagine this in your mind being grabbed and like pulled off the train tracks because maybe you're walking down the train tracks and you're and you're deaf you can't hear that the train's coming and it's coming from behind you to get raptured off the tracks is to be violently 
grabbed and taken away before the train destroys you, okay? So um, let's look at this. Let's look at what, um, how is the rapture defined in Scripture? And so we know, number one, that it is a, a what, we're not talking about when it is. Let's just lay the foundation that it is. It is an event in Scripture. So what is it? So let's define what it is. And um, I want to give you some scriptures. So I hope that you guys can either write these down or uh, if you're driving or flying or whatever you're doing, you can look at it later. But um, the rapture is specifically mentioned in scripture and context is everything that it's specifically mentioned in scripture regarding the church in our New Testament setting. See, why do you put it that way? Because there's been individual raptures that have happened. Uh, Elijah was taken up into heaven. That's a, that's a description of a rapture. Uh, Enoch is a great picture of God translating Enoch from earth um, right up into heaven. That's a type of rapture. Um, listen, the Bible tells us that Philip in a, in a limited fashion. Remember Philip in the book of Acts? He was preaching and people were accepting the Lord and he was preaching to, to the Ethiopian eunuch and God's using Philip. Uh, and then he is lifted and taken by the Holy Spirit and he finds himself suddenly in a different place in the book of Acts. I mean, that's crazy amazing, right? So do keep that in mind that um, the rapture is not an odd thing. There are hints of it throughout scripture. Uh, Isaiah 26 verses 19 to 21 is a pretty cool thing to look at in the Old Testament. But the rapture is the removal of the church. That's its function. Okay, we'll talk more about that later. We may not get to it all in today's podcast, but we'll get to it. But I'm going to ask you to write these uh, verses down. The, the number one overwhelming rapture verse in the scriptures regarding you and I. Are you ready? It comes from Jesus himself. Jesus is the first one to tell us about the rapture. I'm going to ask you to put these puzzle pieces together. Number one, Jesus in John 14 verse 1. Jesus said to his disciples just before he returned in the great ascension of Christ back to heaven, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I, I would tell you, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, oh, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So let's march through this for a second. Jesus said, don't let your heart experience seismology, seismos. Don't have an earthquake of worry and of fear. Why? Because if you believe in God, believe also in me. That's the gospel. In my Father's house are many mansions. We'll talk about what that means in other forthcoming podcasts about mansions. What are these dwelling places? Well, whatever it entails, Jesus said, if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm not kidding. I'm not fooling around. Jesus is saying this is incredibly, happily, profoundly serious. I go to prepare a place for you. So whatever the rapture event that he's describing, it's defined this way. I'm giving you this promise. I'm leaving. I'm going somewhere, my father's house. Because I'm going to prepare a place for you. In Texas, they would say, for you all. That's really good. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you to myself. Qualifier. That where I am, there you may be also. Get that right now. Everybody, take a deep breath and take it in. Jesus says, I'm going. Where are you going, Jesus? To my father's house. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. There's 
awesome dwelling place is there for you. I'm going to go prepare it. What does that mean? We have no idea, except that he's a contractor. Jesus was a contractor when he was living under Joseph's roof uh, in Nazareth. That's pretty cool. What is this contractor building? We don't have a clue, but it's going to be amazing. But when he's done, and when his father says to him, go, he's going to come and he's going to get you and I, or whoever, and he's going to take us to where he's been working. He's going to take us to where he's been preparing. Do you get it? He's going to take us to where he's been building mansions. Again, I'm not going to get into what mansions mean right now. Is it an actual dwelling? Is it an apartment? Is it your body? Is it, is it a... Is it a city? Is it a, we'll talk about that later. But the awesome thing is, is that Jesus makes it very clear. I got to go to go prepare. I'm going to come back, grab you, and take you to where I have been preparing. So friends, listen. If you believe uh, in a post-tribulation rapture view as I used to, that makes it really tough. Because in a post-rapture view... Uh, at the end of the tribulation period, you've got the church going up into the atmosphere, meeting Jesus and coming back down to establish the kingdom. How in the world do you ever get John 14 fulfilled if that's the, if that's the truth? It doesn't work. I, I, look, I already did all the gymnastics on this, and you just tie yourself in a knot, among many other problems. But listen, I love you anyway. So I'm, I'm a pre-tribber radic radically so. You, you'll see this. But... Um, Here's one of the reasons why. Remember, we're defining what is the rapture. So forget about the placement. If you're pre, pre-wrath, mid-trib, post-trib, doesn't matter. This is what it is. Revelation 3.10, Jesus says, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour which shall come upon the world, the word implies the entire globe, the entire world, to test those who dwell on the earth. That's an amazing statement. That was given to the church at Philadelphia, book of Revelation. Jesus says, I'm going to keep you from an hour that is going to come upon the earth that will test all those who are earth dwellers. That's a cool thing because we're not earth dwellers. You and I, we have our citizenship in heaven, says the Bible. We're only here working right now for Jesus. We're working for company God to spread the gospel, to tell as many women, boys, men, boys and girls the gospel, and then we plan on getting out of here. So that's, that's wonderful. Again, we're talking about defining it. Okay, we're not talking about the placement. We're not even talking about yet the why of it. So Revelation 4, beginning at verse 1, this is very fun. So when you look at the book of Revelation, which is key, the book of Revelation gives you a perfect breakdown of the book when John is told, John, write this down. Write down the things that were, the things that are, and the things that are about to come. So the book of Revelation, chapter 1, gives an announcement that it's broken up into three chronological, we'll just call it dispensations. I know the word dispensation drives people crazy, but just calm down for a moment. Don't worry about it. Dispensations are three, let's, uh, three epics. Or th How about this? If we go to L.A. and we go to a play or we go to a musical uh, and we're watching Les Miserables, they may have... Uh, three different breaks uh, for the entire three-hour presentation of that musical. Are you with me? Think of it that way. There are three breaks. That which was, John. Uh, the, the, the messenger says, John, write, write, write that down. And so what was, was the revelation of Jesus Christ. Write down the things that are, the letters to the seven churches. He writes those down. And the things that shall be. And that starts in chapter 4, verse 1. Are you ready? Here it goes. Revelation 4, 1. After these things, the word in Greek is meta tauta. Meta tauta is the word meta tauta, these things. After these things of the first compartment, the revelation of Jesus Christ, this is who he is. And by the way, go ahead and read it. 
It's awesome. It's the book of Revelation is all about Jesus Christ. It's not about the church. It's not about the Jews. It's not about the Antichrist. It's all about Jesus Christ. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay? So it's so amazing because it tells you there in chapter 1 that he is the one who lived. He came, lived, died, and lives again. Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, somewhere around verses 4 through 8, it tells you that it's he who was dead, and behold, he's alive forevermore. Isn't that awesome? It's about him. And Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3 um, also carry with it the descriptions and attributes of the Lord in the Old Testament. That's why you read about, we're not even going to make it. I'm looking at the time clock, you guys. It's like, we've, I've been talking for 18 minutes already. This is ridiculous. We haven't even gotten into this. Remember when Jesus says in Revelation, I walk through the midst of the seven lampstands? Not eight, not nine, seven, not six, seven. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches? <laughs> Those were seven churches in Asia Minor, which is Turkey today. You can go right now, by the way, you can fly there and, take, and go visit. Those archaeological sites, they're there for real. They're not made up. When Jesus says, I walk through the midst of the seven lampstands, it tells you in the Bible that the lampstands are the churches and that Jesus walks through the midst of them. What's amazing about that is that the seven lampstands in the book of Revelation is the seven lampstands that's given to Moses in the book of Exodus and Leviticus regarding the lamps, the menorah. And you don't hear anything about it until you have Genesis well, you have ex Exodus and Leviticus, Genesis, of course, the first five books, the Pentateuch, given, given to Moses by God, mentioning the menorah that was in the wilderness and the menorah that was in the temple later on with the kings, with David and all. And then you don't hear about it until book of Revelation. If you read Genesis to Malachi, because you're Jewish, skip the entire New Testament and read the book of Revelation, you'll be shocked as a Jew to see how well you understand the book of Revelation. No one's going to understand the book of Revelation without reading the Old Testament. It's almost like a test. The book of Revelation, book of Revelation judges you and I. It basically says this. Hello. Hi. Excuse me. Have you read your Old Testament? Because don't even start reading here until you go and read the Old Testament, because you're not going to get it. The dragon, the kingdom, all the stuff that's the, the, the descriptions of the heavenly and demonic entities. You got to go to the book of uh, the Old Testament to understand all that. So when it says, after these things, I looked, John says, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Notice. A door is open in heaven. John is the last apostle to have lived. John. He's the author of the book of Revelation. He's the pen, I should say. He's the quill. He's the pen. The first voice which I heard was like a trumpet. Like a trumpet. It means it wasn't a trumpet. It was like a trumpet. Speaking to me, saying, come up here. And I will show you things which must take place after this. After what? After you're up here. Isn't that great? Think of this. Walk the, just listen how this goes out. Immediately, John says, I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in the appearance like an emerald. I have no idea what that means. When I think of rainbows, I think of the rainbows that you see uh, in, on a rainy day. This is a, a rainbow behind the throne of God that is in some way, shape, or form uh, resembles an emerald. I, I don't understand. That's weird to me, but that's amazing. It's going to be incredible. 
Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, that's important, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads, and from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. You say, I thought there was one Holy Spirit. There is one Holy Spirit. But the seven spirits of God is answered in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Uh, you can read that later, but you'll hear about the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of might, the spirit of power. And it goes on and it gives you the, the list there in Isaiah chapter 11. By the way, the thrones, the 24 elders, the 24 thrones, uh, we know who these guys are. We don't have to guess, and we'll find that out later. Uh, you can read ahead if you want, but check it out. From all of this, it takes place. The seven lampstands are burning, which are the seven spirits of God. Verse 6, Revelation 4, verse 6. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. That's beyond description, in my opinion. You should look at some of the... The ancients drew some pencil or chalk drawings or charcoal drawings of how they viewed that. And quite frankly, it'll scare your pants off. It's freaky. There's all kinds of angelic creatures before the throne of God. Uh, they don't all look the same. They have different orders, different authority, different functions, different looks. And uh, one of these four living creatures, if you look at just one of them, they have, they have eyes all around them. By the way, we know this for a fact. You say, how do we know? Because it doesn't say it, they had something that looked like eyes. That's typology. John, that would be John trying to describe something that he can't figure out. No, John says the four living creatures were full of eyes in the front and in the back. Wow. The first living creature was like a lion. This is so cool. The second living creature like a calf. My granddaughter asked me about this last night. Was it last night or this morning? Last night? The third living creature like the face of a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. There's a reason for that. So each of these things, each of these angelic creatures have one head. And they have four faces. One head, four faces. And the four faces represent, listen, the four faces described here. Each of these creatures are the symbol types known in Scripture that refer to the four Gospels. They're related to the four Gospels. Those images of, of those faces, for example, I'll give you, I don't want to spend time on it yet, later, but we're out of time, uh, is uh, one is a face of a man. Luke's Gospel is Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. Okay, that's just a hint for next time around. So you guys, like usually, if you attend the church here or you listen much, um, I didn't get through hardly anything. Um, but we're going to keep going on this because you've asked some great questions. We're going to give you arguments and answers. We're still working on defining the rapture. We're going to define the rapture in our forthcoming podcast. So mark this down as installment number one. We're going to have to wrap it up. It's been at it for 25 minutes now. So listen, you guys, like always, please hit subscribe. Tell people about this. Join in. Make this almost a little small group thing. Take this podcast. Get some people together. Play it. Talk about it. Get your Bibles open and let's grow. Um, but it's listen, it, more than ever, it's time to live out. It's obvious that it's time to live out your, your faith. It's time to live out. Uh, what you believe in. And that's why we say it's time for real life. Well, look at the days around us. It's absolutely insane. So again, go to jackhibbs.com. We want you to uh, hit subscribe. Uh, let us know. Give us a rating. That really helps us. It sends it. Look, we're going to live with, with or without your rating, but it sends a message to the tech giant guys that people care. So they, that matters to them. But do tell people, please, let's make this thing grow, not because we have to, but because we're speaking truth. Okay? Get the word out. So.